Hi, everybody. I'm Dan Glickman. I was the Secretary of Agriculture back when Lincoln started the Department of Agriculture. <laughs> and I think that's why Frank asked me to be here. Because, But anyway, I'm delighted to be here. I'm also a, a graduate of jo the George Washington University, so uh, that's OK. <laughs> The, the law school, and I'm proud to have been here. So I'm opening the program today basically on the issues of climate. And I would just, for the students in the room, I have one piece of advice. It's the advice that John Maynard Keynes gave to students a long time ago. He said, for every complicated problem, there is a simple and a wrong solution. So as you listen to all the issues of climate and GMOs and food production things. This is a, a highly complicated, extremely important area. And I'm delighted that Frank and GW have taken the lead uh, to try to capture this issue at the highest levels at the university level, because it's really important. And a French philosopher said, you are what you eat. And uh, that's true in all parts of eating, how you grow it, what you raise, how, you know, what the nutritional components are, and uh, how that contributes to a more uh, politically stable world. So the issues of climate, I would just mention a couple things. When we talked about climate, the first uh, words we used were global warming. And remember, our former vice president used those terms a lot. And those terms became highly politicized and uh, not always subject to rational discussion, particularly from a scientific level. So the next phase is the issue of climate change, which is what we're talking about right now, which is essentially uh, the same thing, although it's broader, because climate change does not necessarily always mean uh, warming. It could mean high amounts of precipitation, drought, and related things. And then the term that I actually like the best, because I think it's the, it's the term that is most relevant for people who are not in this field on a day-to-day -day basis, is weather variability. Because average people can understand changes in weather because weather is a little more of a short-term phenomenon than climate, which uh, to some people's minds represents, you know, kind of a, an elite concept that may not necessarily be relevant to them. I guess my underlying point is they're all the same. The issues are critical. Something is happening out there in the atmosphere. And agriculture, more than any other industry, is most affected by this. So once we understand that, then it's worthwhile hearing what, what's happening, what are the causes, and how it affects production agriculture. So today, we have a senior ecologist and climate specialist from the greatest department in government, the United States Department of Agriculture. Dr. Meg Walsh is here. She's an ecologist with the Climate Change Program Office at USDA, and it's responsible for coordinating climate research and program activities at the department, nationally, internationally, and among the other federal agencies. She has contributed to climate assessments and projections, including reports issued by the U.S. Global Change Research Program and the National Research Council, as well as to guidance on greenhouse gas accounting methods for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Prior to joining the USDA Climate Office, her work has included environmental monitoring in the U.S., in China, and Mexico, developing ecological indicators, identifying sources of landscape change, stratospheric ozone depletion, laboratory measurements, comparative watershed case study analysis, and other analytical implementations, things that I can't even spell that she's out leading the world on. She holds a PhD in ecology from Colorado State University and conducted her postdoctoral work at the National Academy of Sciences. So it's a pleasure to welcome a great USDA scientist who's contributing to the discussion and uh, the implementation of good sound public policy on the issue of climate change. Please welcome Dr. Walsh. Thank you all very much. Well, good morning. Thank you. I've um, been listening to this morning's discussions backstage, and it sounds like we really have our work cut out for us, yes? Um, and I think these things sound complicated because feeding people is complicated, and it's important that we get it right. All the things that Dennis was just talking about, they're all happening in influencing food. And while they're happening, climate is influencing all of those things. I think there's some hope in that complexity, and we're going to get back to that later. But for now, what you should be thinking about is that in order to ensure food security, um, you need to be thinking about all those things, and you need to be thinking about how climate change factors in. So let me um, show you what I mean. <laughs> 
maybe. Ah, there we go. All right. In 2010, there were several climate-related events that had some influence on food security around the world. I'm going to highlight a couple here. In the upper left of the map, you'll see a big brown spot. There was a major drought in Russia. It affected over a quarter of the country's grain growing area. What was over 97 million metric tons of production in 2009 was somewhere south of 70 in 2010. Uh, at the same time, in Pakistan, there were major floods, which is the blue spot that you see on the map on the, on the lower right. 20% of the country was flooded, much of the agricultural land. Uh, and this is in a country where there are already 60 million people who are considered food insecure. So these are, it's just a brown spot on a map, right? Or it's just a blue spot. But these things have very serious implications for those living them. And they have effects that can ripple out through the world. The Russian drought caused a spike in wheat prices globally. And that had an effect. So we know that historical climate variability matters because we've lived it. Um, so let's see what happens to drought as we go forward. I'm going to show you a series of 20-year chunks of time, starting with now going to the end of the century. So this includes today, this includes the 2010 drought in Russia and the floods in Pakistan. Um, I'm going to suggest that you pick a part of the world that you're interested in and just focus there as we go through this. Um, otherwise, it's just a lot to take in. Now, I can't guarantee that anything really interesting is going to be happening in your part of the world, but there will be a quiz later. So um, go ahead and um, let's do that. Let's start on. So we're starting with now and then the next 20 years. No, oh, it looks like we're already at the end. Okay. So how many of you saw a change? Did you see a change? Yeah? So, okay. So quite a few of you. Um, now, we know that drought isn't going to manifest exactly the same everywhere. A drought in the Horn of Africa and the, a drought of a similar severity, say, in the American Midwest, different things are going to happen with regard to food because there are just different structures in place and different ways things are, are managed. But we do know that drought makes a very big difference across many different kinds of circumstances. Um, and we know that there are places where it may be more frequent. So let's look at temperature. This is going back for a thousand years. It could go back 10,000 years and it would look very similar. If the medieval Warming is here, you can see it. It's not much of a blip. The little ice ages, not much of a blip. Um, and going back 10,000 years, it stays within this pretty narrow range of variability, which is to say that agriculture developed, came to be during a very stable period of climate. Now we're seeing changes outside this historical range. Um, this is just based on observations. And we're seeing effects on agriculture based on these changes. And this is what we think may be coming. So we should expect that there's more to come in terms of agriculture and climate change. We're already seeing the effects, and those effects appear likely to accelerate. So what does this mean for agriculture? Temperature has an effect in many ways. Um, there, we have longer growing seasons, which in some places allows us to double crop. We also have plants, crops, and animals, livestock um, have optimal ranges of temperature where they do very well, and then critical temperatures over which um, yields can decline and production can decline. Uh, so for example, if there's a very hot period during the flowering stage of pollination, um, you can destroy a crop entirely within a half a day if the timing happens to coincide. Precipitation, um, you saw on the map, some places get more, some places get less. That may sound a little more equivocal than it is. Even in the places that are getting the same amount of precipitation in the future um, or even more, there appears to be a trend in many places where there are longer periods without precip and then short, sort of punctuated events of very intense precipitation. So that makes water management more of a challenge. Carbon dioxide sort of supercharges crop growth. Um, 
the speed with which, which it develops, though, can be so fast that it doesn't necessarily allow for complete grain fill. So how yields are affected really depends on specific circumstances. And, and we talked about extreme events with the droughts and the floods. Um, it's been estimated that over the last about 30 years, agricultural yields globally would have been higher by about 40 million metric tons per year in the absence of climate change. Now, production still went up during that period of time, largely the consequence of technological improvements, but if not for climate change, it would have been going up that much faster, they think. There are also what we call indirect effects on production. Um, so the temperature, precipitation, carbon dioxide, and extreme events, they all affect weeds and insects and pests and disease and fire. And then those things in turn affect agricultural productivity and yields. Also, economics feeds back. Farmers are very sensitive to markets. And a weather event on the other side of the planet can affect what, for example, a corn grower in Idaho decides to do. I've pulled out livestock here. Livestock is food, um, but it's also, in many parts of the world, large regions. It's an income, it's a savings account, and it's a retirement plan for people. Um, warmer win winters reduce mortality in livestock. Um, forage, uh, but climate change also affects the availability and the quality of forage and feed. Heat stress. Um, it, which maybe this is a little intuitive. When it's very hot, animals don't want to eat a lot, maybe like you and I, and so the production can actually go down of things like milk and meat and eggs. Uh, and as disease and pest move around and change frequencies, uh, heat stress can actually affect the immunity of an animal and potentially make them more susceptible to illness. Now, farmers are extremely adaptable. <laughs> Never underestimate the ingenuity of a farmer. And uh, existing strategies for managing this kind of variability are very likely to be helpful, um, uh, particularly over the next few decades, and to help offset many, but not all, of the effects of climate change on production. Beyond that, we saw that this was probably going to be an accelerating problem, so we're likely to need new strategies, tools, and practices for successful adaptation. That said, some adapt adaptive practices are easily deployed and inexpensive. Others are very costly and may even require capital investments that not, not all producers are going to have the resources for. So I want to talk about this idea of productivity shifts. Some places there's going to be more production uh, as a result of climate change. Some places less, some places it may not change much, but they may be growing things that are very different than what they've grown in the past. We spoke earlier about critical thresholds and temperatures in crops, and so you might already have guessed that in the tropics where it's already warmer, they might already be closer to these thresholds, although it is sensitive to you know, types and varieties, it's, it's, they're just closer to these thresholds. So in many countries in Africa, up to 50 percent uh, or more sometimes of the caloric intake comes from corn. It's a very important crop. What we see here is on the left, these are field trials. These are from observational data. For every degree of temperature increase over 30 degrees centigrade or about 86 degrees Fahrenheit, every day over that by every degree, you get a 1 percent decline in the corn yield. That's if there's enough precipitation. If there's drought, then you get a 1.7% decline for every day that you're, for every day, deg degree day that you're over that threshold. So um, we might expect that somewhere between 65% and 100% of, of corn grown in Africa is going to be influenced by these changes and have, have some reductions in yield. I'm sometimes asked if then production at higher latitudes may not compensate for that. So let's look at that. So under a changing climate, temperatures become amenable to wheat production 600 kilometers further north in Russia than they are now, which potentially opens up a lot of land. Uh, but these maps are showing us 
anticipated shortfalls in food production in Russia through 2070. So what's going on? Well, further north, the soils really don't support this kind of widespread agriculture. And then in the south, more frequent and more intense droughts are expected, um, and, and so diminishing the yields there. And so Russia might be looking at shortfalls even internally, given some of these considerations. Canada has a similar situation with regard to the soils being suitable for this type of agricultural production. And in the southern hemisphere, there just isn't a lot of land at the sort of temperate and higher latitudes. So large increases in production at northern latitudes or at higher latitudes are not necessarily a given. Um, and, and compensating for reduced yields elsewhere could be a challenge, particularly beyond mid-century. Now, we all know that food security isn't just um, the ability to grow food. It's also about being able to acquire food and whether people can afford it. So the less of something that's grown and the further away it's grown, the more costly it's going to be, which then sets you up for some choices. Do you pay more for food? Do you, um, uh, do you pay more for food? Do you switch to things that are cheaper now and, and more available? Uh, and there's also the potential outcome that um, you might just have access to less food. So climate change can affect what you buy as well as how much of it. So there's this trade-off for people of low, lower means, um, these decisions that need to be made, even in wealthy countries. And, and climate change plays a potential role here. I'm going to talk about the utilization of food, and I'm going to talk about it in the sense of food safety. So the question is, so if food is available and you have access to it, can you use it? And I'm going to give a few examples. For example, for each degree of temperature increase over about 10 degrees centigrade, the infection rate from typhoid increases by 5 to 10 percent. In Australia, public health officials anticipate that by 2050, all else remaining equal, that mortality from typhoid might double by 2050. Now, given this kind of information, one would hope that um, all things would not remain equal. And given, given the information, adjustments can be made. But that's the sort of thing that is being investigated. Another example comes from oceans. Fishing cannot occur during harmful algal blooms. Um, uh, the they're potentially deadly and indetectable in the food. So uh, an example, there's a species, Alexandrium catinella. And under a changing climate, the growing season for that particular species is expected to go from 68 days per year to 259 days per year. So that could have a large effect as well. And we spoke earlier about the effects of heat stress on livestock. Um, In order to manage that, farmers and ranchers can move animals inside during a heat spell, and that's a useful way to adapt to that kind of change. Um, but there's a, there's a converse side where you move the animals closer together when they're in contact for longer periods of time. It's easier for disease to transmit between one and another for insects and viruses and things. So this is just to, there are other examples, but this is just to point out that even given adaptation, these aren't simple questions necessarily with simple fixes. I'm going to talk quickly. So we've talked about the availability of food, access to food, and utilization. I'm going to just talk quickly about the underlying stability of the climate in, um, in speaking to that. So what we have here is a smooth statistical curve of what summers looked like in the 1950s. The, uh, the white is, would be an average summer. That's where you know, most of the summers happened. Highest peak on the left, that would be a cooler summer in the 50s. And on the right would be a warmer summer in the 50s. And so this is where it's been going through 2011. Um, so the most common summers today would have been unusually hot in the 1950s. That, that's become the norm. 
Uh, and an average summer then would be a cool summer for us now. So I'm going to, this is just another way to visualize, that, visualize this. This is in the United States. These are heat records versus cold records in the United States since the 1950s. Uh, and you can see that there's a growing trend. There are more heat records being established in the U.S. than, uh, than cold records. And so things are shifting, climate is shifting, and with it, our ability to feed the planet. Now, I was asked to talk about what all of this might mean for businesses and what businesses might be thinking about um, and, and how all this fits into the food system. These are really important questions, but there's not yet a lot of scientific literature to support many conclusions. But there are some interesting hints, so let me just talk about those for a minute. So with changing geography of agriculture and things originating in different places and different kinds of crops coming from different places, that's going to change your needs. So for example, as the ideal region for growing corn, temperature-wise, encroaches into what used to be wheat territory, the very fact that corn is four times as bulky as wheat grown in, on the same land area changes your needs. It changes your transportation needs, your storage needs, all, all kinds of things. There is an indication in the U.S. There's one study that implies that perhaps there would be a, um, a shift from barge traffic to rail traffic and trucks just because things are sort of moving away from waterways potentially. There are trends in consumption that relate to seasonality, uh, and this maybe makes more sense than it sounds like at first. In the, in the fall, and the colder temperatures, people tend to crave more heavier foods and starchier foods, and then in the spring and the summer when it's warmer, fresher foods and lighter foods. Given shifts in seasonality, it might be worth considering changes in consumer demands and preferences related to climate change. And higher temperatures stress the electric grid. So, so food, types of food and food chains that rely on continuous cold chains might have some extra challenges there. There, similarly, just in time logistics, where, uh, where the d processing and distribution of goods um, is done at about the same rate that consumption happens. So companies don't have to maintain large storage facilities. It's very sophisticated, but with the potential for increased disruption in transportation systems, some thinking might need to go into that. So these are just hints, um, and to date, no systematic assessment of the effects of climate change on the food system has been conducted. Now, for this reason, USDA has commissioned a report uh, on this very subject so we better understand what's at stake. Uh, the report's expected in the fall of 2015. We have a flyer out in the hall that describes where we're going with it and it has my contact information. So if you would like to know more or would like to uh, express what you think maybe would be useful to have in the report, please let us know. Um, we'd be happy to hear from you. All right. So. I'm going to suggest that the very complexity of this climate change issue is what gives us a road into addressing it. The fact that climate change touches on so many different things and interacts in so many different ways is, is what makes it possible to address some of these issues. So a development plan can be an adaptation plan. Um, a public health plan can be adaptive. Um, research all this stuff can be adaptive if you have climate change in mind during its development. Um, and you can make sure that it is adaptive and that it serves to secure food supplies into the future. So with that, I want to thank you and I want to thank the organizers. Um, I'm going to, uh, we're just going to recap here, but it's been my pleasure and I hope I've offered you something useful to take through the day. To recap quickly, quickly, I promise. Um, Climate change affects all four of the traditional areas, areas of food security. We're already seeing the effects of climate change, and those effects appear to be accelerating. There are some winners and some losers, production shifts in this whole question, um, but we don't expect that to be a panacea um, to solve all the problems. And finally, changing geography, costs of refrigeration, potential disruptions to transportation systems together imply that strategically thinking businesses and decision makers may want to consider climate change in their um, operations and planning.
So it's my hope that you can think about these subjects as you listen to the other topics that we're going to hear about today, because what it seems to add up to is this, which is if you're going to deal with food security, you need to be thinking about climate change. Thank you.